ต้องบอกว่าให้เวลาอีกสองนาทีให้คนมาจอยโอเค I think we'll uh, we'll get started. We have almost everyone here. Um, first thing I'd like to ask is uh, if you have the internet bandwidth, I would love for you to turn on your video so I don't feel like I'm the only one here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nice to see uh, everybody's faces. Uh, obviously, we are not all together in the classroom, but we will try and create the illusion here. Uh, in HCI that we're, we're all together. So very much appreciate that. Okay, so um, let's dive right in. Um, obviously, we're going to spend most of today talking about logistics for CS228 human computer interaction. I realize it may not be that interesting, but we got to get all the formal stuff out of the way before we can get to the, the fun stuff. Um, so I am Josh Bongard. I'm the instructor uh, for this course, and I'd like to welcome you to CS 228 human computer interaction. Uh, I don't know about you all, but this is my first class uh, of the semester. And obviously, this is going to be a semester unlike any other semester any of us have experienced. So I just wanted to say a few moments, a few things about that uh, before we get back to, to HCI. Um, obviously, we are living through changed and changing times. Um, the thing that I would ask of all of you, and Amanda, the TA, and I will do our best to reciprocate, which is to adapt as best we can and be open to change. Uh, nobody knows how this semester is going to play out, so we will do our best uh, to adapt and try and create uh, as much of a distraction-free environment for you as we can so that you can study and concentrate uh, on the course while at the same time keeping, keeping us all safe. So I, I appreciate that. Um, speaking on behalf of the faculty, um, obviously we wish we could provide you with a distraction-free environment so you could study uh, and learn HCI at your leisure. Unfortunately, we can't do that. Uh, I don't know how many emails you all got yesterday and I cringe to think how many more you're going to get today. Uh, I realize there will be a lot of distractions and notifications and changes and regulations as we go. Again, please just do your best to adapt. Um, if anything is unclear at any time, just let Amanda and I know and we will do our best to help you navigate uh, HCI and, and 
UVM as best we can. So I wish you all the best this, uh, this semester. Okay, so um, I am going to share my screen and start walking us through the first, uh, the first few slides, which as I promised is mostly going to be, uh, is mostly gonna be logistics this morning. Okay, can you all see my screen? You can just type into chat if you can, that's fine. Okay. Okay, great. So um, let's just get oriented. Um, your first um, point of arrival for the course is Blackboard. Um, you'll go to Blackboard to find basically two documents, the syllabus and the schedule. I would suggest you bookmark both of those uh, documents all of the information about how this course is run, when assignments are due, what materials are available, uh, when you can find them all there. Blackboard will also be our point for you to submit all of your work uh, to be graded. So Blackboard, the syllabus and the schedule. I wanna start uh, with the syllabus. And again, I'm just going to re I'm going to walk through this top to bottom again, not the most interesting thing in the world, but I want to make sure that we're all on the same page, uh, literally and figuratively before we get into the, the meat of the course. Uh, obviously, we're meeting here uh, 830s in the morning, 830 in the morning. Um, I am a morning person. I don't know about the rest of you. So I appreciate you uh, showing up to class. My experience has been that students that quote unquote come to class uh, are successful in this course. So please do make an effort to be here uh, at 830. And this will be the Zoom link that we'll use and it'll be the same Zoom link for every meeting. Um, I'm more comfortable with Zoom. I think it's a better experience than Microsoft Teams. Um, if we end up being Zoom bombed uh, on a regular basis, we will move to Teams, but until further notice, we'll have uh, lectures here on Zoom. Okay, uh, I already introduced myself. Uh, Josh is fine, there's my email. Um, I'm gonna hold office hours remotely on Mondays 11 to noon and Thursdays 11 to noon. And I wanna just walk you through how office hours are going to work. Uh, if you click on the link there, it'll take you to uh, a spreadsheet. Um, here's the instructions for how to sign up and meet me for uh, office hours, but I'll just walk you through this. You'll notice starting on row 11 here, these are all uh, my office hour meeting times. So for example, uh, if you wanted to meet with me uh, this Thursday, you'd come to the spreadsheet and just type your name in here. And there should not be a link there for now. Okay, so you type your name in there and then when I'm ready to meet with you, I will attach a link to your name that points to a Zoom meeting room. And the minute you see that your name is linked, you can click on that link and join me in that Zoom meeting room. If you wanna meet with me on Thursday, you come to the spreadsheet and you see that somebody has already signed up. Uh, you just put your name at the end of the line here. And again, if you see Josh B's name is linked, that tells you that I'm meeting with student Josh B. And then the moment you see your name linked, that, that's my signal to you that I'm ready for you to come in and join me for a one-on-one -on -one office hour. Make sense? Okay, if you, uh, if you come to sign up and we get to the end of the hour, we get till noon and I haven't linked your name, I've run out of time and uh, just move your name to uh, a future meeting time and we can meet then. Okay, so back to the syllabus, uh, that's office hours. It'll be the exact same thing for Amanda. If you click on Amanda's uh, office hour link there, um, you can sign up for office hours with her. Um, speaking of Amanda, she's here on the call somewhere. Amanda, can you wave so everyone knows who you are? Hello. There she is. Okay. Uh, Amanda will hold office hours Mondays 4.30 to 5.30 and Wednesdays uh, 11 to noon. We already talked about Blackboard. Um, just because we don't have enough online platforms in place, uh, I thought we would use Discord. Um, if you want to chat informally with myself or the TA or the other students, uh, click on the, the Discord here. Probably most of you are familiar with this kind of interface. Pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Type in your question or if a comment or something that might be useful to another student, go ahead and, and chat away uh, here. Um, expectations, obviously, uh, myself and Amanda will not be available to answer your questions in Discord 
24 seven, we will do our best to be attentive to any questions that are, that are posted here. Make sense? Okay, great. I'm just trying to make sure that I can keep an eye uh, on chat here. Someone when says- When I was trying to use that Discord link earlier, um, it said it was expired, so you may just want to refresh that. Just okay, awesome. I have absolutely no idea how to do that, but uh, Amanda will, will help me with that and we'll refresh that, that link. Thank you. Um, yeah, so again, just about questions. Obviously, if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask your question or type it into chat and I will try and keep an eye on it there. Okay, um, so we'll talk about the schedule in a moment. We'll come back to that, but I just wanted to go finish going through the syllabus. Um, here's the, the blurb about the course. Um, what we're going to be doing, this is, we're going to be focusing on the design mostly and the evaluation of user interfaces. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about implementation, but not very much. There is a sister course to this course, which is software engineering. The focus on that course is much more uh, on coding and software design and the internals of your software system. This course is the complement to that course. We're going to be focusing on all those aspects of software systems that, uh, are, that the user is in contact with. So how do we design the outward appearance and function of the system to make it uh, as usable and intuitive to the user as possible? And how do we know whether we've done that design right? We're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about user evaluation. How do we quantify a good user experience with a, with a software system. We're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about different software systems running on different hardware platforms. Um, we'll spend very little time talking about familiar platforms like uh, laptops and desktops. We're gonna spend much more time talking about uh, very different kinds of electronic uh, equipment and software running on it. The main example that's going to be the running example throughout this course is uh, the Leap Motion device. Uh, I have mailed a Leap Motion device to every one of you. If you have not yet received your Leap Motion device, uh, put a note in the spreadsheet where, uh, the, for the mailings and Amanda and I will get back to you about that. Okay, so uh, I just want to pause and talk a little bit about the Leap Motion device. Some of you may have already played around with it. Um, once you get the software uh, installed, you can start up. Um, you can start up the visualizer. Can everybody see the visualizer running on my screen? No. Okay. I think I'm only sharing uh, my browser. Let me try this again. Okay. Can everybody see uh, see the visualizer demo now? Okay. So uh, I've got my Leap Motion device here, and if I put my hand over the Leap Motion device, you can see exactly what the device is doing. It is capturing in near real time the 3D positions of all the major bones uh, in my hand. And you can see that my physical hand is steady, but my virtual hand is jittering. Why is that? If you have an idea, you can go ahead and type it into chat. Some of you probably played around with this. Now, now it's steady. Actually, that's pretty good. So usually you're not holding the leap motion device in your hand while you're doing this, but I wanted to make sure you could see everything at once here. Uh, as I mentioned in this class, we're gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about design and trying to create uh, intuitive, uh, intuitive, uh, intuitive user interfaces. Here's a good example, actually, in the, vis in the visualizer demo of a user interface. There is a lot that went into the design of this user interface that gives you a hint about how the Leap Motion device works. If anybody has an idea, they can go ahead and unmute themselves and uh, offer up an idea. What aspects of the user interface here suggest how the, the Leap Motion device works? Any brave volunteers out there? Multiple infrared video. Exactly. So Robbie there said um, a multiple infrared video. So you can see, um, actually, if I turn the Leap Motion device towards you, you can 
hopefully see there two infrared cameras there. So we're getting back in the Leap Motion device. Leap Motion device is getting back. Uh, it's getting back two camera images. It's getting back basically the time that it takes the infrared light to leave uh, the device and reflect back. So brightness at each pixel in each uh, in each uh, in each image here is representing the time it took for that reflectance. And there is some machine learning code that's already built into the Leap Motion device that is taking those pixel those brightness values and using them to infer the 3D position of one hand and possibly see if I can do two hands. Okay, a little hard to do on the fly here. You can try it yourself or, or two hands. So that's the Leap Motion device. We'll, we'll spend a lot of time talking about that uh, in the course. Let me share my screen again. Okay, um, so we're going to talk a, lo a lot about Leap Motion device. We're going to talk uh, about a bunch of other topics as well. I mentioned already we're going to spend a fair bit of time talking about design. We're going to talk about human factor. So what is it about human physiology in the case of the Leap Motion device of, of the hand? What is it about human psychology that affects our design decisions when we go about creating a user interface? We're gonna look at uh, some other interactive technologies beyond laptops and desktops and smartphones and leave motion devices. We're gonna look at self-moving interactive devices, otherwise known as robotics. We'll talk about wearable technologies, which are obviously interactive technologies that are on the skin. And right at the end of the course, we'll talk about cybernetic implants, which are interactive technologies that exist under the skin. Um, the heart of this course is a significant programming project, and again, we'll come back and talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Okay, so what do I hope for you? My objectives, my objectives, um, my teaching objectives here is to help you understand the nature of design as it relates to technical and interactive systems. It's easy to take a new piece of technology, like a leap motion device, and write code for it to see to make it do a lot of cool things but a lot of those things may not be of things that are of interest or utility to the user. So we're gonna spend quite a bit of time thinking about not just what the technology can do, but what a potential user would want it to do. Okay, so we're gonna try and understand the challenges and implications of that idea, which for the moment, we'll just use this sort of catchphrase of putting the human first in design. Okay, um, you're gonna gain a lot of practical experience in this course, designing and creating interactive uh, systems. As I just showed you, uh, Leap Motion out of the box comes with some machine learning that takes raw infrared data and turns it into 3D coordinates representing the positions of the human hands. There are gonna be a series of 10 programming projects throughout this course. You're gonna complete one of these programming projects a week um, so at the end of 10 weeks, you will have a software system that takes the 3D coordinates of the hand and recognizes whether the user is trying to, deci is trying to sign one of the 10 digits in American Sign Language, or ASL. So you're going to write some machine learning code that's going to translate the positions of the hand, which are given to you by Leap, into is the user signing zero, is the user signing one, are they signing none of the 10 first digits? That'll take us through the first 10 weeks. You'll all have more or less the same software at the end of those 10 weeks. In the remaining four weeks or so of the semester, you're going to add, you're going to take that recognizer, that ASL recognizer, and turn it into an ASL educational game. At the end, you should be able to place the Leap Motion device down in front of someone who has never seen that device before. And by waving their hand over the device, there should be some visual feedback that suggests what the device is trying to get the user to do. And the device and your visualization and the entire design of your software system should walk your user through learning and then remembering the digits that make up the ASL uh, language. Okay, so a lot of programming uh, in this class. You'll get a lot of practical experience with how to design interactive systems. Okay, um, computer science is changing fast. Machine learning and AI is changing faster. 
HCI is changing even faster than that. The way I first taught this course back in 2007, and I actually kept some of the slides in the slide decks, and I'll point them out when we come to them, to just show you how much this course has changed over the last uh, 13 years. So another one of my objectives is to help you prepare for a world in which there is continuous and ubiquitous human machine interaction. And we are almost there already. Uh, for better, for worse, from sunup to sundown, most of us are interacting with our systems. Obviously, we're all interacting with our laptops and Zoom at the moment. You might be wearing your cell phone that might be vibrating throughout the lecture and reminding you of something. There is continuous and ubiquitous interaction going on already. But obviously, it is going to become much deeper and broader as the years go on. It's going to be very interesting, very non-intuitive. It's going to be um, a lot of fun and a lot of ch uh, big challenge. And I'm hoping that a lot of you can get, gain the skills in this course to be a part of the HCI revolution as we move forward. OK, so that's what I hope for you. Um, in order to make that happen, here's the various course materials. First, there is no textbook uh, for this course. Um, there will be links to the assigned reading for each day in the schedule. Um, and that re reading is mandatory and will be required for that day's quiz, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment. Most of the reading will be drawn from the standard HCI textbook, Designing the User Interface. Um, most of the material here is drawn from the sixth edition. If you get an online version of another edition, that's probably fine. Um, some other material will be drawn from uh, a textbook that I wrote with Rolf Pfeiffer a few years back called How the Body Shapes the Way uh, We Think. And uh, thanks to the wonders of modern publishing, for every copy of this book that somebody buys, I make a grand total of $1. Um, there are 66 people signed up for this course. So if all 66 of you buy my book, I will make a total of $66. Not much of a financial incentive for me. So obviously, if you decide to buy the book, I will be very honored, but it's, it's optional. Okay. Uh, there'll be readings drawn from lots of other materials. Again, the links will all be available uh, in, from the schedule. Okay, lecture. Obviously, um, this is a synchronous remote course. Um, we will be meeting here 8.30s in the morning. Um, I am recording uh, the, the Zoom meetings. I will put uh, all the lecture videos up on YouTube after class. During the lecture, um, it's assumed that if you answer a question or ask a question or leave your video on, you are tacitly agreeing to being recorded. Um, so if you do not answer a question in class and you leave your uh, video off, we're obviously not recording you. So it's up to you uh, how you want to uh, uh, handle that. Okay, uh, I've taped all of my lectures going all the way back to 2000, I think four or five years ago. They're all available as YouTube playlists. Uh, you can go and have a look um, if you like. Uh, Zoom etiquette, most of us are probably pretty familiar with this uh, at the moment. Um, there's a lot of us here on the call. Um, so please mute, mute, mute yourself uh, during lecture. As I just mentioned, uh, it would be great to see as many of your faces as possible so I don't feel alone during lecture. Um, helps to create a sense of, of community as, as we go along. Okay, so as for asking questions, uh, I am trying my best to keep an eye on chat as we go and not doing a very good job. There it is. Okay. Um, so you can either uh, just type a question into chat, and from time to time, I will uh, refer to the chat and, uh, and answer any questions. Uh, if you want to ask a question uh, through audio, I think you can raise your hand. Hopefully, I can see that. Can somebody raise their hand, or all of you raise your hand, and I can see if I can see that. I can see your hand in the video, but I think you can also click on your name and raise your hand. Okay, yeah, I see that coming up as a notification. Thank you. Okay, so if you, if you want to interrupt me and ask for clarification or ask a question, you can click on your own panel and click on raise your hand and I'll see that as a notification. I will pause when I reach a good point and call out your name. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. I think that's probably the easiest way to do that. Okay, um, versions of the lecture slides are linked to from uh, the schedule. 
Um, you will notice as we go along that the versions of the lecture slides that you have are not quite the same as the ones that I have. You'll notice uh, at certain points in the uh, slide deck, there are uh, red boxes that are placed around empty space in your, sli in your slides. In mine, you will see the same red box, but there will be material filled in. That's my way of just prompting you from time to time to annotate the slides as we go. So hopefully you have a version of the slides uh, with you. You can also do this after the fact while you're watching uh, the, the video on YouTube. Maybe difficult to follow along with the lecture and annotate the slides if you don't have two monitors. But I, again, I found that most students are successful in this course if they're not just passively sitting back and watching the slides fly by. Please do develop your own strategy to actively engage, um, to actively engage in the, the lecture material. Okay, uh, I see some of you talking about how to raise hands in Zoom. That's great, thanks, thanks very much. Okay, all right, I will again pause when we get to one of these red boxes to just remind you uh, of this. Um, if you in previous classes have needed a, a note taker, I have tried to set up the course so that you don't need a note taker watch the video lectures after class as many times as you like and annotate the slides at your leisure. If you still feel you need a note taker, please let me know as soon as possible. Okay, uh, at the end of every day that we have a lecture, by 11.59 p.m. on that day, there will be a multiple choice quiz that you need to take in Blackboard. So when lecture finishes, I will go to, to Blackboard and set the quiz. It should be available around noon. So you have between noon and 11.59 p.m. You have about 12 hours to prepare and take the quiz. If you came to class and listened along with the lecture, <clears throat> and if you've done the reading for that day, the quiz should take you about three minutes. Very, very quick. It's designed to be painless. Um, and again, this is just a gentle prod to help you keep up with the, the lecture material. Uh, again, maybe not everyone likes quizzes, but I found this is one of the, most, the least painful ways to, to keep us all on top of, of the material as we go. Okay, any questions before I continue? That's a lot of material already. All good so far? Okay, so let's carry on. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a programming intensive uh, course. Um, all code is gonna be developed in JavaScript. Uh, at the beginning of this summer, I did not know, know JavaScript, so I had to teach myself some JavaScript to set uh, the assignments. Previous years, uh, pre in previous years, we uh, did the programming projects in Python, but um, the Leap Motion device is a legacy device. It's been around for a few years, and the software development kit, the SDK that comes along with uh, the Leap Motion device is only compatible with Python 2. Most of you probably use Python 3 now. Um, we also had a lot of uh, pro problems between dependencies of different Python libraries working well with Leap Motion. Turns out that we don't have any of those problems um, in JavaScript. So that's why we're doing uh, the whole course in JavaScript. Um, again, if you're not familiar with JavaScript, this is also a good excuse to teach yourself a little bit of uh, client-side web programming. It is not expected that any of you have intensive uh, experience with JavaScript. Um, if you haven't programmed in JavaScript before, can you type no into chat? I just wanna get a, a brief sense of how many people uh, have not programmed in JavaScript before. Quite a few of you. Okay, so we will uh, we will all learn together. Okay, what you will see in the first programming uh, project, which I will assign in a few minutes today, there are links to an online tutor JavaScript tutorial. Um, the first time you create a JavaScript variable, the first time you create a function, the first time you create a for loop. There's a link to a tutorial. So I've tried to make it uh, easy for you to learn JavaScript as you're setting up some code to interact with the Leap Motion device. Uh, I also recommend Code uh, Codecademy if you wanna learn uh, a language. It's a really good online tutorial, very low overhead. Um, if you have some time this week, you might wanna just bite the bullet and work through the first few uh, tutorials, JavaScript tutorials in Codecademy although that's optional. Okay, um, 
We will also throughout this course make use of three main JavaScript packages or what in Python would be known as libraries. Um, P5, we're going to use that for doing visualizations. It's a drawing uh, package. You will be using P5 this week for the first assignment. NumJS is short for numerical JavaScript. We will not use that package this week. It'll be used in a later week. Um, NumJS is going to allow you to capture uh, data from the Leap Motion device and store it in vectors and matrices and manipulate that data using the NumJS package. Um, in about four or five weeks, we're going to start using the ML5 JavaScript package, which is, as the name implies, is a machine learning package. You're going to be using that to, to feed into ML5. Uh, a, 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 a matrix which contains data captured from the Leap Motion device, and you're going to create a machine learning algorithm that attempts to recognize whether that data represents the signing of an ASL digit. So visualization, data manipulation, and machine learning. Okay. Again, obviously it's not expected that you've seen any of these libraries before. You'll learn them as you go along, but if you want, you can start to play around with them in JavaScript now just to familiarize yourself. If you like, completely optional. Okay. Um, the item that is usually of most interest to, to you all is uh, how do I grade the course? There is a 5% grade for participation. And I'll talk about how we calculate that grade uh, when we get to the schedule. As I mentioned, there's a daily quiz on every day that we have a lecture. There are slightly more than 30 lectures. So in Blackboard, your quiz will be due one, will be, each quiz will be worth 1%. When we get to the end of the semester, I will see how many lectures and how many quizzes we have and normalize the weights of all of the quizzes so that each quiz will probably be worth slightly less than 1%, just to keep that in mind. Okay, as promised, there's gonna be 10 weekly programming projects or deliverables, each one is worth uh, 5%. So as you can see, half of your grade is keeping up with these programming projects. So just keep that uh, in mind. In the last four weeks of the semester, uh, in the 11th, 12th, and 13th week, you'll be submitting an interim video and this video is going to be just proof to Amanda that you're keeping on top of turning your system into an educational game. And we'll talk about that when we get there. And then at the, uh, the end of the course, there is no final exam in this course. Instead, we will use our two hours and 45 minutes for each of you to present your final project. Um, again, there are 66 of you, so that means each of you will have about two and a half or three minutes to uh, demonstrate and describe your system to us. That's not a lot of time for a presentation. We'll talk about how that works uh, at the end of the semester. Uh, there's a question here, do we have a quiz today? Uh, yes, you do have a quiz today. So as I mentioned, I will set the quiz. It should be available on Blackboard by about noon today and you have until 11.59 uh, p.m. tonight to complete uh, the quiz. Okay. Any other questions? All good? Okay. Um, so uh, some of you are graduate students uh, taking this course. I don't know how many. If you are taking this class for graduate uh, credit, can you type yes or grad into uh, chat for me? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so seven. All right, so not too many of you, that's fine. Um, there will be some extra work that's expected of you, but that won't be until the second half of the course. We'll talk about it then. Okay, so uh, responsibilities, student responsibilities, late policy. Um, if you submit material one day late, um, it will be docked 25% of the grade. If you submit it two days late, it will be docked 50%. After that, um, you don't really need to submit anything. That's fine. Okay. Cooperation, let's talk about that. Um, obviously, this is a programming intensive course. There is no way that Amanda and I can police you all that you're not putting your code up on GitHub and making it a public repo and sharing your repos. Um, so student cooperation is 
perfectly fine, but up to a point, and we're gonna do this on the honor system. So um, it's very important that each of you work your way through the 10 programming projects rather than copying and using somebody else's code for the simple reason that when we get to the 11th week, if you don't understand how the 10 uh, programming projects fit together, you will be unable to turn it into an ASL educational game. So my suggestion is, again, you really focus on trying to implement all of the programming projects yourself. If you get stuck and need some help, please do reach out to the TA, but you should be doing, you should be coding this up. Uh, you should be coding up um, all of these programming projects yourself. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, participation is 5% of your grade. That does not mean that I expect perfect attendance, especially this semester. There are gonna be a lot of hiccups along the road. Um, you are uh, permitted to miss up to and including three classes. If you find that for some reason you're missing more than three classes, please come and let me know and we can try and make some accommodation uh, for you. Um, how do I know whether you're present or not? As I mentioned, we'll see that in a moment. There is a virtual sign-in sheet um, that's linked in the schedule and we'll see that uh, in a moment. Okay, if anybody else needs accommodation or exception, uh, has exceptional needs, please let me know. Any questions about uh, any questions about all of that? Uh, Ryan says, "Can we put our final project on a public repo?" That is absolutely fine, and actually, it's encouraged. Um, what a lot of students in past years have done is to use their ASL educational game as part of their code port portfolio when they went for a job interview. So I'm hoping that you do have something uh, flashy and interesting to demonstrate to a potential employer or friends and family at the end of this, this course. That's perfectly fine. Any other questions? All good? Okay, so uh, let's switch and have a look at the schedule now. Okay, so uh, I will put this up at the beginning. Uh, I'll put this up at the beginning of lecture uh, every day. Um, obviously, you can see we're here today, Tuesday, September the 1st. Here's a link to the slide deck, which we'll carry on with when we finish uh, the schedule. There is some required reading for today. Um, when I set the quiz, uh, I may draw a question from the slide deck, from the reading, or both. So again, if, as long as you've gone through the slide deck, you've been here for a lecture, and you've done the reading, the quiz should take you about three minutes. Some days I, I link to some optional reading or some other fun things that are related to the HGI concepts we talked about uh, today. It's optional. Okay, so uh, you'll notice that there's a link now to the first deliverable, which is being assigned to you now. So we will talk about deliverable N every Tuesday morning, and that deliverable N is due at 11.59 p.m. Uh, the following Monday. So you can see this coming Monday, September the 7th, deliverable one is due at 11.59 uh, p.m. I'll talk about the deliverable in a moment. Here's the attendance sheet. So if you click on the attendance sheet, you should be able to find your name. I see many of you have found it already. So if you haven't, take a moment now, click on that link, uh, type yes next to your name. The attendance sheet is editable during lecture time. After lecture, I will change the sharing uh, permissions on this file so that it's viewable only. So what I suggest is uh, just before class, um, just a few minutes before class, I'll, I'll uh, make that day's attendance sheet editable, type your name in there and you're ready to go when class starts uh, at 8.30. If you're a couple minutes late to class, that's fine. Just make sure you click on the attendance sheet and indicate you're here. Okay, I will leave you to finish that up. You can do that uh, up to 9.45 this morning. Okay. And Amanda says there's a link to the attendance sheet in the schedule, which, and the schedule is accessible through Blackboard. That's right, thank you, Amanda. Okay. Okay, so let's have a look at the first deliverable. Okay. 
Okay, so figure one, here's basically what you're gonna be implementing between now and Monday. What you're gonna be doing in JavaScript is creating an infinite loop, and every pass through that infinite loop, we will be, uh, the leap motion device will be capturing data from a human hand if there is one over the device. As just mentioned, the leap motion device translates raw infrared camera data into 3D coordinates. You are going to condition that data. You're going to manipulate it, filter it, uh, flip it around, and then send it to the P5 uh, drawing library and use it to draw a dot to the screen so that when the user moves their, the tip of their index finger over the leap motion device, there will be a dot on the screen that moves in the same way that your fingertip uh, moves. Um, obviously, the user is looking at the screen and based on what they see, they're going to move their hand. So very, very trivial human computer uh, interaction here. In deliverables uh, 2 through 10, you're going to be elaborating and complicating this feedback loop. So this infinite, this infinite loop is going to be the heart of your programming project. And at the end of 14 weeks, you're going to have most of you are going to have several thousand lines of code, but at heart, it's going to be this real-time infinite loop and influencing what the user does based on what they see and on the JavaScript side, altering its behavior based on what the user does with their hand over the device. Make sense? Pretty straightforward? Okay. So... <clears throat> Um, in this course, as you, as you work your way through the deliverable, at the end of the deliverable, you're going to be submitting something to Blackboard for the TA to grade. You are not going to be submitting any code in this uh, course. Um, if your code is buggy or you don't know where the bug is, Amanda and I also don't know where the bug is. It's hard for us to look at your code and be able to assess its quality. So instead, you're going to be submitting images and videos. And those images and videos are going to uh, convince the TA that you successfully implemented that week's uh, deliverable. So one of the videos that you'll be submitting is something that looks like this. Which first of all shows that you're able to use the P5 library. You have a randomly moving uh, dot. You should have that about partway through deliverable one. And at the end of deliverable one, you should have something that looks like this. Obviously, as you can see from my video here, uh, you don't get points for cinematography. We don't need a beautiful video. We just need to be able to see the device, your hand, and your screen. And you can see that clearly I am drawing the position of the tip of my index finger correctly. Okay. So far, so good? Okay. Okay, so um, just a few notes about this particular deliverable. Um, obviously, the first and most important thing is that you receive a leap motion device. Um, so when you start in on deliverable one, there'll be a link that'll take you to the, the mailing here. Just type in here that you've received your device. And hopefully, once you get everything installed and the visualizer is working, you can type in here that, yes, your leap motion device is working. You're going to be doing uh, some installation uh, starting on step eight here. Um, you're going to be using version two of the Leap Motion SDK. Um, if you have a Mac machine, this should take you just a few minutes. If you are a Windows 10 user, however, uh, you're going to be asked to perform a manual fix, which is a little bit of a pain uh, in the neck. Unfortunately, we can't skip over that. So please do start on this deliverable uh, as soon as possible, especially if you are a Windows 10 user. Um, we've tried our best to make sure that all of the instructions here cover all possible computer platforms that you may have, but uh, there may be some other versions of Windows out there, or Linux, that don't work so well with the SDK. So I want us as a class to iron out all the installation issues as soon as humanly possible so we can all get back to focusing on the more interesting HCI aspects uh, of the programming projects. 
Again, um, Amanda and I both have office hours, so please tackle this as soon as possible, especially, or at least, please get to step nine as, as early as you can. If you have any problems, uh, contact Amanda and I or come and see us in our office hours and we will help you through that. If you are having installation issues, uh, oh, Amanda, you got a question or comment? Yeah, I was just gonna comment really briefly on that. Um, one, the document we're looking at right now is a slightly outdated version. It's been updated. We actually updated it yesterday. The one in Blackboard is the correct one. It has a link to the instructions on how to fix the Windows 10 issue. Um, that being said, it can be a little bit complicated sometimes. Um, so my, my first office hours are on Wednesday. Um, Dash's are on uh, Thursday. I have a Windows device. I have done the fix myself. So if you please try it, um, it's that part of the deliverable is really easy. It's really quick. If you know what you're doing, it takes like two minutes. You can also spend two hours trying to fix it on your own. Um, so please, please come to office hours or just message me if you have any questions about the fix if you're on Windows 10. Great. Thank you so much, Amanda. Yes, my apologies. This, this is the older version of the, uh, of the deliverable. If you click through from Blackboard, you will find uh, the updated version. Okay, there is also another question in chat. Uh, will this SDK overwrite Leap Motion for Unity? That is a great question. I have no idea. Um, so, Robbie, if you have this working already for Unity, I'm not sure. Um, if you're brave enough to give it a try, please do and report back. I don't know if anyone else has already done any development with Leap Motion and Unity. Um, just let us know, and I can add an item to the deliverables here helping anyone navigate that particular issue. Thanks for that. Okay, um, so again, as promised, uh, as you work your way through uh, the deliverables, you'll see from time to time, like, like on step 14 here, there's a request to pause, take some video, use your, use your smartphone. Again, things don't have to be beautiful, but just double check your video that we can see your hand, we can see the device, and we can see what's happening on your, on your screen. Create a YouTube playlist and add that video to the playlist. And then at the, e the very end of the deliverable, uh, at the very end of the deliverable, you'll be asked to go back to Blackboard and submit your deliver the, the result of your deliverable. The only thing you're submitting is a link that points to your YouTube playlist. So when we come to grade your, uh, your deliverable, we will see that in Blackboard. We will click on the playlist. In that playlist, there will be three or four videos, however many were asked for in the deliverable. We will check those videos to make sure you've implemented all of the required uh, functionality. So obviously make sure that all the videos are uh, at least public or unlisted so that we can, we can see them. You will notice uh, as we go on that some uh, deliverables are longer than others. So again, please don't leave this to uh, the night before. Uh, in this deliverable, especially as you can see, it's pretty long. There's a total of 75 steps spread out over nine pages. They're all, each individual step is pretty straightforward with the exception of step number nine, which has to do with installation. So it may take some of you a while, uh, but again, it's, it's a lot of it is mechanical programming work. So please leave enough time to do uh, the deliverables. Okay, uh, any questions about the deliverables before we move on? Okay. All right, so back to the schedule. Okay, um, so moving on, uh, we'll go back to the slide deck in a moment. Um, you can see that I've broken this course up into one, two, three, four, five themes um, to just sort of impose some structure uh, on the course. Not surprisingly in the um, not surprisingly in the first section here, it's a lot of logistics, but we will get to the basics of HCI, what distinguishes it from the other branches of computer science. Uh, then we'll move on to again, focusing on design as it relates to HCI. How do you go about thinking about creating a new kind of user interface? You're gonna have to do that starting in week 11. What do you present on the screen to somebody who has never seen the Leap Motion device before? So, 
some of you have never seen this before. Um, when you start to do some user testing with friends and family and you put this device on a table in front of them, what do you think they are going to think this is? You can either raise your hand or chat and uh, type an idea into chat. What is the lead motion device? Some sort of touch device, exactly. So in past years, when family and friends have been recruited for user testing, they go and touch the Leap Motion device. It's a USB, a motion sensor, they're right, that's pretty close, a USB drive. You'll notice that um, people have very different expectations about what this is. So the very first design decision you are going to have to make is what do you show on the screen so that someone doesn't do this, they don't, do this, they don't do this. How do we get them to actually uh, wave their hand correctly over the device? Okay, I think my video has frozen. Can you all still hear me? Yes. You can hear me. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's soldier on here. Okay. Um, so again, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about design. How do we approach uh, HCI design? We will then um, move on to cognitive psychology. So as I just mentioned, the moment your uh, potential user sees the leap motion device, they have an expectation about what it is, a USB device or a motion sensor or a touch device. And they consciously or unconsciously immediately make a prediction about how to test their expectation. So if somebody thinks this is a touch device, they may start touching the top of the device to see whether it responds. So uh, obviously psychology is a huge topic in and of itself. We're gonna focus on one aspect of psychology, which is that the human brain is a prediction machine. It is continuously generating expectations and predictions, and the human brain is continuously generating actions if I touch this device, I expect it to do something. And those actions are designed to test the expectation or the, the prediction. So how do we design a system to channel, support, uh, correct predictions, and help the user as quickly as possible wean themselves off of incorrect predictions and expectations? To do so, we'll spend some time talking about just a few aspects of cognitive psychology, mental models, how do people build up a mental model of what they see around them, memory, attention, and perception, uh, and finally, affective computing, which is the emotional side of psychology that is relevant for uh, HCI. Okay, fourth, uh, in the fourth section, uh, which I've titled Looking Outward, again, we won't spend a lot of time talking about traditional desktops and laptops. We'll be spending more and more time talking about devices that, have, that are uh, increasingly being deployed out into the world and being embedded uh, and being embedded in that space directly. They're directly sensing what's going on in the world, like the leap motion device in real time. And some of those, those devices are able not just to sense how the world is pushing against them, literally or figuratively, but they are also active devices. They are able to act themselves and influence the environment or the human user that is trying to work with them. And that's gonna take us into a short uh, session, uh, a short, short series of lectures uh, on robotics. Okay, in the final uh, part of the course, we will flip things around and look inward. We'll talk about virtual reality, augmented reality, and finally cyborg technologies that are not sitting on the skin but under the skin. And again, in the exam period, you will then have an opportunity to show us uh, your ASL educational game. Okay, that's the schedule. Any questions about that? All good? Okay, so back to uh, the slide deck for uh, today. There we go, okay, I think that's, that looks good. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, um, there is this uh, attendance element. Here's some, uh, here's some data about why. This is from my other class, CS206, Evolutionary Robotics. But what I found over the years is that uh, the less classes you miss, the better you do 
in my courses. So again, please do try and be here for lecture. I realize you don't strictly have to be. You can watch the lectures uh, on YouTube after the fact, but uh, it's much, much better if we're all here learning together. Okay. So um, let's talk a little bit about why HCI is an important topic. That's a little better, okay. Um, obviously computers have changed completely uh, over the years um, and they are continuing to change. Not only have computers changed, however, but the way in which we interact with computers has changed even faster than computer technology uh, itself. Most of you are probably familiar with these here. Uh, how about this mysterious machine here? Anybody know what this is? The Commodore 64. Very good, Cole. Yes, this, this was my first computer, so I'm dating myself here. Anybody know what this computer is? Top left. Uh, the MK1, that's a, good, that's a good guess. Joseph says the Harvard MK1. This is actually the ENIAC. And you can see that there is a person inside the computer. Uh, obviously, these days we are mostly outside our computer, but we're getting back to a, a blurring of distinction between inside and outside with uh, uh, cybernetic uh, technology. When I first taught this course in 2007, we had a section on touch technology, and I started that lecture by saying, imagine in the not too distant future when we have a lot of devices where you can simply tap the screen and the computer will respond. Touch screens were still mostly science fiction 13 years ago. It's, it's amazing how quickly things change. And the implications of the way that we interact with computers that are touch enabled, there have been a lot of those implications. Okay, so same thing. Imagine in a few short years when we have these kinds of technologies uh, in common usage. What's this technology up here? Google Glass, exactly. So I think um, about four or five years ago, Google Glass appeared and this was it. This was gonna be the final computer technology. Everyone was gonna be wearing Google Glass. Uh, or Apple Glass or whatever, we would get rid of, we'd get rid of these cell phones once and for all. There'd just be the cell phone basically here. We wouldn't have to hold anything. We wouldn't have to look down at any screen. It'd be all Google Glass all the time. And it was a complete failure. Anybody know why? <laughs> Privacy, exactly. So most people that bought uh, Google Glass were perfectly happy to use them um, because they were fun to use and an interesting technology. So it wasn't the users that were adversely impacted by Google Glass, it was the stakeholders. People that were being, that were involved with the technology somehow, but not with their, by their permission. They're, they're, the minute they left their house, if they were in a public space and someone was wearing Google Glass and was looking at them, they were now involved with the technology in, indirectly. Um, obviously, privacy is now uh, a big issue with a lot of other uh, HCI and AI technologies, but I think Google Glass is a great object lesson in thinking very carefully about not just what the technology can do, but how it might be received by, uh, uh, by the general public. We're gonna spend a lot of time in this course talking about acceptability um, as opposed to usability. Usability is how easy is it to use a given technology. Acceptable, as the name implies, is how acceptable is it? And how acceptable is it to whom? It's often a difficult question to, to answer. Okay, so Google Glass has kind of come and gone. We'll see if wearable technology makes a resurgence. Um, what about this technology down here? Anybody know what this is, a cochlear implant? Yeah, exactly. I don't know if anyone on the call actually has a cochlear implant. We'll talk about this towards the end uh, of the course. Um, this is something that is implanted uh, un uh, under the skull and provides wirelessly uh, sound pressure waves arriving at the ear and directly electrically stimulates the cochlea. So not a hearing aid, not something that amplifies sounds, but something that transduces sounds changes it from one physical uh, phenomenon into another. Pressure waves in the air into electrical stimulation of the cochlea. 
Um, some people are mentioning Neuralink here. We will also talk about Neuralink uh, at the end of the course. Um, robotics, uh, robotic uh, exoskeletons, we'll also talk about that, an interesting HCI technology that is just starting to emerge. There are a lot of outstanding and interesting design questions about how to get uh, neural prosthetics and robot uh, prosthetics right, how to design them so that they are usable and acceptable. Okay, here's another recent example. Um, I don't, we're not in Innovation Hall today. Innovation Hall is a brand new building. When you walk into the first floor of Innovation Hall, uh, you see this sign, which lists the offices or the, or the uh, rooms that are available on the first floor at the top of the sign and fourth floor classrooms at the bottom of the sign. If you think about it, this seems anti-intuitive. Why is the bottom floor listed at the top of the sign and the top floor of the building listed at the bottom of the sign? Because you're at the bottom of the building, because you're closer to the first floor, why does that dictate that that should be placed at the top of the sign? People look to the top of the sign first. Right, so there is a connection, implicit connection that is being exploited by the sign between physical action. So entering a building and in this case, uh, a cultural action, which is the fact that since uh, this is written in English and most people that enter Innovation Hall, uh, English is either their native tongue or they know English. And in English, you tend to read from top to bottom. That's not true in all languages. So that was identified by the sign maker and, and so it makes sense or it feels intuitive that the first thing you see when you enter, enter a building is the first floor. The first thing you see when you start to read a sign as an English speaker from top to bottom is that you would expect to see the first floor at the top of the sign. Again, it seems like kind of a subtle thing, but uh, as you start to take this course, I'm hoping that you observe all the objects around you in your environment and see the design of that object through the eyes of an HCI designer. Okay. All right, apologies. Back to a few more uh, housekeeping notes before we get on to the meat uh, of the course. Just a little bit more about expectations. So what will uh, Amanda and I expect from you? Um, we'll expect feedback, uh, as you can already notice. I try and make these lectures as interactive as possible. So please do uh, pipe up in chat or raise your hand if you have a question, comment, or an idea. You're never interrupting, that's perfectly fine. Common sense, regular but not necessarily perfect attendance. I already mentioned that. Um, hard work, uh, again, a lot of these deliverables, there's a lot of steps. Some of them are longer than others. You're gonna be programming in a, a language that you're not familiar with. Uh, at the senior level, that's sort of an expectation that you can figure all that out. Please do keep up with all the uh, deliverables. Um, they're cumulative, as you'll see. So like math, if you miss a deliverable for that week, the next week you're gonna to have to finish the previous week's deliverable before you're able to tackle that week's deliverable. So please, we expect you to do your best to keep up with uh, the weekly assignments. You are gonna have lots of opportunities to demonstrate creativity in this course. I hope you take advantage of that. We also expect self-learning. Neither Nam Amanda nor I are gonna teach you JavaScript. There's lots of stuff out there on the web that you can find to teach yourself positive attitude when working with, with all of us. I think that goes without uh, saying. What you cannot expect from the TA and myself is help with buggy code. As I said already, we don't know where your bug is. You don't know where your bug is. We can help you with high level uh, concepts, but we can't debug your code for us. If you wanna come to office hours and you're having problems with your code, um, help us with the concept that you're struggling with. Why are you not able to debug what's happening? What step are you stuck on in the deliverable? We will try and help you at that level rather than debugging your code for you. Okay. Okay, what you can expect from me and the TA, uh, this item here I added uh, given the current circumstances. Amanda and I will, uh, you can, what you can expect from us is flexibility within reason. So obviously uh, we are going to have to adapt as this semester goes on. There are gonna be unexpected things that crop up 
for some of you, unexpected things that crop up for Amanda and I, we will do our best to work through them. Uh, I realize this can be an uh, anxiety inducing time for a lot of us. If you do not submit an assignment and uh, we assign you a grade of zero and you write in and say, I couldn't submit because I was anxious about COVID, that will not be accepted as a valid uh, excuse. If you're having problems or something crops up, the moment that that happens, please let us know as soon as possible so that Amanda and I can make, uh, we can make arrangements for you. Make sense? Again, this also comes back to common sense. We will do our best to help you if you let us know uh, in time. Okay. You, what you can expect from us is help with general programming questions. There may be some concepts in JavaScript that you've never experienced before. You've tried to look it up online, but you're still confused. We're happy to talk about general programming uh, concepts, tips and tricks. That's perfectly, perfectly fine. Um, in particular, I'm happy to help with conceptual issues. We're gonna talk about lots of different concepts in this class. Some of them you will have a chance to implement in code, some not. I'm happy to, to chat about that during office hours. You're mostly gonna be working on your own, but again, there's a chance to, to collaborate or share ideas. If there's issues you're having with your fellow students, let, uh, let me know. Please do ask clarifying questions as we just saw in deliverable one, there was already a little bit of a, a hiccup there. So please uh, speak up when you see something that doesn't make sense. And Amanda and I will try and uh, clarify it. Most importantly, <clears throat> Most importantly, what you can expect from me, at least in lecture, is an emphasis on concepts rather than specific tools. One question that will not be on the quiz is how many cameras are in a leap motion device? It's not really relevant to what we're talking uh, about. Um, last year, we taught uh, the programming projects were in Python. Uh, a few years back, we were using something other than leap motion device. In a few years, we'll be using something other than a leap motion device and probably a different programming language. In computer science and HCI, hardware and software comes and goes, but basic concepts like the difference between acceptability and usability, for example, those concepts are unlikely to change anytime soon. So we're gonna see a lot of examples of different technologies in this class. I don't expect you to madly try and memorize every detail of that technology that I mentioned or that's mentioned in the reading. What I do hope you, to re what I do hope you remember is what was it about that uh, technology that was an exemplar of some concept? So uh, we just talked about the leap motion device. I just talked about how in deliverable one, you're gonna be creating this infinite loop where we have feedback between what the user does and what they see as a response. They have an expectation about what this leap motion device thing is. That expectation is probably wrong. So we're gonna try and design a visualization to help teach the user without writing anything, any English on the screen, any tutorial. We're gonna try and visually demonstrate to them what the system is. Okay. Okay, so we've got, uh, we've got seven minutes left. So let's talk a little bit more about why human-computer uh, interaction. As you can see here, the screenshot is pretty old, but I think the basic idea is still the same. Uh, quite a few years back, the number one job in the US was a software engineer. Uh, so a good reason to take HCI is that there's obviously a lot of good, pay, well, good paying jobs out there about HCI. There's a lot of good software engineering jobs out there as well. But the HCI jobs, in my personal opinion, are even more interesting because they're both technical and usually give you an opportunity to be creative, right? So uh, again, in your final project, if you're able to create a, a really engaging and interesting HCI project and demonstrate that to a potential employer, some of the best jobs that are out there, both financially and intellectually, are, uh, are jobs where you're creating interactive software or you're working on the interface side of a software system. According to CNN a few years back, software engineer was the best job out there and college professor was second. So for those of you that become software engineers, uh, you'll have an even better job than I have. Okay. Why HCI, just to continue this, uh, back uh, in the summer of 2016, on the front page of the New York Times, there was an interactive visualization about forces that were pushing college students uh, out of state. That interactive visualization was made by Nick Strayer, who had taken my class the year 
before. So after graduating uh, from UVM, he was very fortunate to get a job at the New York Times. And within a few months of being at the New York Times, he created an interactive visualization that ended up on the, the front page. So again, there's just a success story of, of what's possible. Okay. Why else might you be interested in human-computer interaction? Because HCI, if the design is done well, you may help others change the way they see the world. And through your visualizations or your interactive system, suggest ways that people can hopefully improve it. This is a screenshot from the Gapminder uh, website. Um, this is an old screenshot from Gapminder. They've got a much more modern visualization now. A lot of the examples in this course will be drawn from the Gapminder website. I suggest you go and have a look at it. You can play around with it. It's got some fantastic interactive visualizations uh, on it. The heart of Gapminder allows you to plot wealth data like GNP against health data, in this example, uh, life expectancy. So we have gross national product on the horizontal axis and life expectancy on the vertical axis. And clearly there is a lot of uh, visual detail here that is meant to communicate patterns in a relatively large data set. What, it, what, are, what, is, um, what, is some, what are some of the patterns that are obvious in just this screenshot? What are some things you're learning about the raw data that's plotted here that wouldn't have been obvious if you just looked at a spreadsheet of this raw data? Any ideas? Okay, let's, let's start. Uh, health isn't increasing as much as GDP, possibly. So health is the vertical axis here, and uh, wealth is the uh, GDP or GNP is on the horizontal axis here. It looks like wealth in these two countries seems to be increasing faster than life expectancy, possibly. Depends on the scale of these axes. What other, what other high level patterns are expressed in this visualization? You can either type any ideas into chat or raise your hand. Don't be shy. Wealth versus geographic region. Okay, so we can see some geographic regions here. So we've got just two minutes left. So let's start to um, analyze what's actually shown in this. Aha, uh -huh. I think uh, Jack here has summarized it pretty well. During this time period from 1975 until 2004, uh, citizens in China were becoming more wealthy more quickly than citizens in the United States, right? That's the main sort of high level picture you can take away from, from this. Okay, so obviously we know that this trajectory here is China because I placed a tag on it. And you know that the yellow circles here are the United States because I placed a tag on it here as well. There are a lot of other details in this picture for which there is no text explanation that you should be able to infer just by the way in which this visualization has been designed. So I think we will, uh, yes, as Jack mentioned, there's a great TED talk on this by Hans uh, Rosling. If you Google Gapminder and TED, uh, you should be able to, to find that TED talk. So just as informal homework, um, have a look at this visualization and see what information is being plotted here that is not directly being referenced by a tag or a label. So obviously two pieces of data we have are GNP and life expectancy, but there is other data that is being visualized uh, here, which you should be able to infer because this visualization has been designed well. Okay, just to wrap up, remember if you didn't have a chance yet, go to the schedule, click on the attendance sheet and indicate that you were present uh, today. And uh, I will uh, set a quiz on Blackboard by about noon today. Um, please do the reading for today. And if you were here for lecture and you do the reading, the quiz should take you no time at all. It's due by 11.59 p.m. tonight. Please get started as soon as you can on Deliverable 1. Uh, after that, I will see you back here Thursday morning uh, at 8.30.
I wish you all a good rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Bye.